May we pray. Holy God, open our eyes to what you would have us see. Open our ears to what you would have us hear. And open our hearts to those whom you would have us love. Amen. This morning we continued reading from the Gospel of Luke, picking up the story right after last week's passage. And today we also, as I said, begin step two of our 12-step sermon series based on Richard Rohr's book, Breathing Underwater. And we've said it already today, but I'll repeat it. In the language of the 12-step program, step two reads, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Well, in our gospel story, great crowds are following Jesus through the land. He is getting closer to Jerusalem and the cross, and the religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes, are annoyed. They grumble among themselves because Jesus is breaking the rules of polite religious society he welcomes the sinners and the tax collectors. He eats with them. And to add insult to injury, he has a good time. And this bugs the religious leaders. And so Jesus tells them two stories that highlight the joy experienced when those who are lost are restored to God's community. The first story is about a shepherd who has lost one of his sheep. He has a herd of 100, and when one sheep is lost, he leaves the other 99 to search for the frightened lamb. He finds it in the thickets, panicked and silent, so as not to attract the attention of predators. The shepherd is so joyful that he has found the lamb, he throws a party for his friends and neighbors to celebrate with him. The second story is about a woman who has lost one of her precious 10 silver coins. You can tell by the way she reacts that she is panicked. Did she drop it in the marketplace? Was it stolen from her pocket or purse? How could she have been so careless? She has nine more coins, but still this one coin is so precious to her. She needs the lost coin to restore the whole 10 that she has been saving for years. The woman turns the house upside down, giving it a long overdue deep cleaning. She sweeps every inch of her small home. Every speck of dust is turned over. Every dark corner is illuminated by her lamp. Finally, she finds the coin and lets out a deep sigh of relief. She is filled with joy, calls in her friends and neighbors. This is a cause for rejoicing. What she thought was lost is now found. Both the shepherd and the woman experienced joy and relief at finding what they had lost. Most of all, their joy is about restoring the lost lamb and the lost coin to the whole. Jesus summarizes by telling the religious leaders, God is like the shepherd and the woman. God rejoices over and throws a party for those who come to God where they belong. In the light of these stories, we return to step two of the 12 steps we are considering. And I'll say it again. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Here in the church, we might substitute some of the language. Perhaps our version might read, when we are found, when we turn toward God, we are restored to the community of the church. As Richard Rohr writes in chapter two of Breathing Underwater, the surrender of faith does not happen in one moment, but is an extended journey, a trust walk, a gradual letting go, unlearning, and handing over. There may be parts of ourselves that remain hidden for years. Still, our journey leads us to be found and restored as a whole. 
When Mary and I talked about the service this week, Mary provided me with insights into the 12 step program and what it's meant for her, just like she did this morning for all of us. And she told me um, of the way in which desperation led her to the group and the joy she experiences in walking the 12 steps and surrendering to God. You can see that joy in her eyes when she smiles. Mary told me that she supposed I had also experienced moments of desperation, and she is not wrong. Although I have not gone to a 12-step program, I have experienced some despair, and turning over to God has sometimes been that slow, painful process that characterizes us religious folk. One turning event that I have in my mind this week is probably something that's been in your mind too, as we observe the 18th anniversary of September 11th, 2001. 9-11 touched my community at the time in a particular way. I belonged to a circle of mothers in our suburban town, and we had mostly come together through our UCC church and had begun to tentatively, tentatively explore our faith together. We were mostly white and married with young children. Our spouses were in the busy early stages of their careers, doing well, but on the way. And they all traveled frequently to client meetings, conferences, and the like. That morning of 9-11, like many others, my husband had flown out of Logan Airport down to Newark for a meeting. As soon as he heard about the t attack on the Twin Towers, he called a car rental company and made a reservation. As he made his lonely way back to Massachusetts that evening, he witnessed the plumes of smoke over Manhattan. We were so grateful to come through 9-11 with our family intact and all our immediate friends were safe too. And still we grieved grieved for those who had not been so fortunate. Simon's car was impounded at the airport for a few days, and my parents, who were visiting at the time, could not fly home to the UK as scheduled. Well, they left, stoic as always, on one of the first flights out of Logan after the attack. That was a difficult goodbye for me. We were all safe and well, and I knew I should be grateful. But of course, our family could not escape the anxiety of the times. In the following year, Simon continued to travel to Europe at least once per month. His mom had died the previous year, and so he generally included a visit to his dad who was sick and lonely. And I would track his flights on the airline's website. And sometimes I panic for a moment when the connection dropped and the plane seemed to stall over the Atlantic. For the following year, our son had difficulty sleeping and suffered from anxiety when we left him and his sisters in the care of a sitter. And I felt like the glue of the family holding us together in some shape or form. But I wasn't doing so well. I'd come into church each week, and when it came time for our silent prayers of confession, I'd tear up. I was so often frustrated with my husband and children, and I didn't understand it. Why did this family, the answer to my hopes and dreams, seem like a burden? Why was I so impatient, so desperate for some time for me, so exhausted at trying to hold everything together? God, forgive me, I'd sigh. Finally, the penny dropped. My confession needed to become a prayer for healing. I couldn't simply try not to do these behaviors I didn't like. I needed help, and so I began to pray for it. Gradually, I discovered the spiritual resources to shine a light into those corners of complaint. I learned to remember to honor my needs as a mother and a child of God, I began to seek out ways to communicate better in relationships and to care for myself so that I could care for others. You might say I was restored to sanity. The joy of restoration has led me to some wonderful places of community. 
On one occasion, I remember, it led me to take our children to worship at our, sister's, our church's sister, African Methodist Episcopal Church in the city. It was the Monday Thursday evening, and we washed feet together with our African-American siblings. The service ran late, and my son got upset that he would not be able to fall asleep that night. So I brought him to the woman I'd been partnered with, and she helped us to pray. And as we drove home to the suburbs after the service, he looked out of the car window and saw a beautiful full moon. And the experience settled him right down, and he was able to sleep soundly that night. You might say we were restored to sanity. And so, what is it that you need restoration from? What is it that you are hiding? Are you one of the religious folk who hide in your strict religion, fearful of hidden things being revealed? Or perhaps you bury things in the busyness of daily life, keeping yourself too well occupied to think or pray? Or are you someone who knows what it is to turn to God in desperation? Have you turned your life over to the way of Jesus and had your dark corners illuminated and swept? Is this something you'd be willing to share one day with the congregation to encourage us all on our spiritual journeys? This week, I heard about a series of discussions organized in Milton by interfaith clergy and community leaders. It's called Courageous Conversations. These are conversations that bring together people across racial divides and talk about issues of racism in our culture today. They sweep the corners clean, opening up and talking to one another about their experiences. Well, some have criticized this movement and say, it's not really doing anything. And yet the leader told me that having people open up and talk face to face has transformed lives and they have begun to restore the wider community. Sometimes doing something saves us from confronting the needs and the fears and the dark recesses of our hearts and minds. Sometimes for God to find us and restore us, we have to stop the doing and allow ourselves to be found. This is what I hope for our upcoming discussion series on the reality, where we are now, and options for the future. For us as a church to pause for the moment in our business and ask God to illuminate the dark corners, to sweep away the dust on what is hidden, for us to face the future with God's clarity and light. Are you ready to be found in the deepest, darkest recesses? of your heart. I hope so, because it will lead to joy and the restoration of community. May all God's people say, Amen. Amen.